Okay, you can turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 10, verse 11. I want to talk about when to move to the next city. So are you talking about going off grid and, and getting out of the city and getting out into the country and things? Well, I do like that stuff, but no, that's not what this sermon's about. There's a concept in Scripture that we need to understand. Um, and it's something I've been going through. I'll talk more about this in another video, but it's something I've been going through as I've been kind of going back and reviewing the last uh, 10 years of my life. And, you know, I think to myself, you know, this is what the Lord wants me to do. And it is. Um, being in, in ministry, uh, international ministry, the way King James Video Ministries has been now for a long time. Um, this is what the Lord's wanted me to do. But that doesn't mean I'm going to be doing this the rest of my life. Uh, there comes a point in time when people start to reject. And all you're doing is just casting your pearls before swine. I'm not talking about any of my saved brothers and sisters. I'm not talking about you. But I'm saying there comes a point in time when you're witnessing to the lost and they're no longer listening. And the Lord says to move to the next city. Let's go over some scriptures here. Matthew chapter 10, verse 11 through 15. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that city, shake off the dust of your feet, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And I remember we used to talk about this when I was at Liberty Baptist Church. We'd go out door to door and things, you know, and, and, you'd, and uh, there'd be times that, you know, people, we were never invited into anybody's house, you know. Um, things have changed, you know, the whole door to door thing. You know, people back in the past were more friendly and they were, you know, many years ago, they'd invite people in and things. But now, I mean, maybe down south or something or some other place, but. Uh, when I was in Pennsylvania, that was not the case. And uh, there'd be times people just get angry and he just slam the door in your face. I'm calling the police or whatever. If you don't get out of here, get off my porch, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, we were there inviting them to church, you know, the whole thing in our suits and ties. And, uh, and I remember it was said numerous times, you know, well, shake the dust off your feet, brother. You know, it's just, that's just the way it works. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think it applies to just ministry in general um, not just door-to-door -door, soul winning whatever type of stuff I think it applies to actual just preaching and teaching of the Word of God there comes a point in time when the people don't receive you anymore and you're just wasting your time and uh, the tricky part is figuring out when the Lord wants you to move to the next city you know what I mean and uh, it's ironic because what happens when you move to the next city all these people say, we got to get you off the internet. We want to get Brian off the internet. We want to get whoever out there, if you have a ministry and things online, and we, we want to shut those people down. You know what they're doing? They're sealing their own fate. They're putting a noose around their neck. But let's keep going here. Acts chapter 13. They are literally judging themselves unworthy of eternal life. We need to do something to stop, you know, these Christians from coming out and bullying those of us that don't want to, you know, believe in what they believe in and stuff. Okay. <laughs> Trying to help you. Care about you. We love you. Trying to get you saved. Acts chapter 13, verse 44 through 52. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. That never happens to me, you know. <laughs> then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing, look at this, seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. You know, there's been times... And I'm sure for you that you witness to somebody and, and the, they reject you and they won't let you get a word in edgewise. And you know what? As a Christian, you'll feel like you failed the Lord. You'll feel like a failure. You'll say, oh, man, I should have said this and I should have done that. And I should, if I would have just, I forgot the verse, I was trying to quote it and whatever else. Um, brethren, 
the whole fact of the matter is, if you were able to say anything about the Lord, if you witnessed to that person, they rejected it, it's not your fault. They are judging themselves unworthy of eternal life. They are the ones condemning themselves. Verse 47, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. I always love that, too. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Hmm. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. You know, there's some really wicked people right now that are trying their very best to get me kicked offline, at least off of YouTube. Very wicked people. They're judging themselves unworthy of eternal life, is what they're doing. And you know what? If my YouTube channel ever gets shut down, if I ever get kicked off of the internet because of these people, you know what I have to do? Shake the dust off my feet. Move on. Their damnation is just. And it, it just cracks me up. You know, people will get all upset at me because I compare myself to the Apostle Paul. What am I supposed to do? You know, it's what the scriptures say I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be a follower of Paul, even as he followed Christ. Christ Paul is my example right now. And this ministry, there's, there's, so many different things that I just, you know, I've seen happen and things over the years. And, it, you know, I, I go from one thing to another and these, these people just continue to follow me and just kind of attack and whatever else. And they stir up things, try to get me in trouble and whatever. And I say, you know, it's, I'm going through what Paul went through. And they get upset about, oh, he's comparing himself to Paul. Well, duh, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's incredible. Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass in Iconium that they both went, or that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. And by the way, I'll just say this. There has been a great multitude that has believed as a result of this ministry. Um, just amazing. I mean, I, you know, I forget about so many of the people. And as I'm going back through... Um, going over all the videos and things and organizing all the stuff that I've done over the last 10 years and going through the letters and just, you know, and I'm just unreal how many people that this ministry has changed their lives. Uh, just thousands and thousands of people. Uh, how many people got saved? I have no idea. I've known quite a few people that have written me and said, you know, your preaching is what got me saved. Um, just huge multitudes of people have had their lives changed as a result of this ministry. And I thank the Lord for being used that way. But, verse 2, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil effect, affected against the brethren. You know, I, I'm fascinated by this. Why people can come along to this ministry, how people can come along to this ministry, and they learn so much from me, and the Lord uses me to change their lives, and then all of a sudden... The unbeliever, unbelieving, wicked people out there come along and they start to sow these little seeds of doubt and little, little attacks against me. And all of a sudden they just turn against me like that. I don't understand that. It's always been something that just confuses me. <laughs> you know, and they'll, they'll claim well, I've, I've changed and things and I prove no, actually I haven't changed. I still preach the same gospel. And then they'll say, well, um, I used to follow you because I was ignorant, you know, whatever. And, and all these different things. And all my enemies, they would have no ministry at all if it wasn't for me. Which is really kind of funny. You know, because their only ministry now is attacking me. You know? Just weird. Verse 3. Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when they, there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, Lyca, 
my thing has the pronunciation thing here. It's probably easier if it doesn't even have that. But, uh, and under the region that lieth round about, and there they preach the gospel. So, in other words, what Jesus says back in the gospels to his disciples of go to a city and preach to it, and if they don't receive you, shake off the dust of your feet and go to someplace else and do the work. Um, that's not some kind of a, well, see, that was back in the Gospels. It's before Jesus died on the cross. So technically, it's another dispensation, so we don't have to do it. Compare Scripture with Scripture. And if you see Jesus saying to his disciples, hey, do this, and then you look and you see Paul and Christians and things doing that, then that means it carried over. All right? The practice is still good today, brethren. And evil men are going to come up and they're going to try to shut down true biblical preaching. And they have to do it using worldly means. Notice they're going to the rulers. They're going and they're getting corrupt things to be done to try and shut the apostles up. Same thing happening to me. Exactly. See, they can't just pray and have God shut me down. Because their God is not my God. Their God, the enemies of this ministry, their God is Satan. Plain and simple. That's why they have no power to just say, well, our God will take care of it. They can't pray me out of ministry. They have to use worldly means to get me shut down. And they'll eventually succeed. Let's just face it. The law is not on my side. You're not going to get a bunch of liberals out there to side with a Bible-believing preacher. They'll go against their own laws, their own rules to try and shut me down. They don't want me online. My enemies don't want me online, so guess what's going to happen? Well, eventually I'm going to be going to another city. And when I get there, I'm just going to kick back and say, ah, retirement. I'm just going to watch some TV and just kick back and drink a beer or something like that. I don't even know what beer tastes like, but I'm trying to prove a point here. You know, that's what I'm going to do. No, I'm going to go there and I'm going to preach the gospel. Whatever the Lord has for me in the future, it's going to include preaching the gospel to the lost. And these people that are against me out there, these wicked people, these lost heathen that are out there, they are actually cutting themselves off from eternal life. It's not the actions of a Christian to just pursue somebody and pursue somebody and pursue somebody. You say, what about you and Stephen Anderson? I hope Stephen Anderson gets saved. I show his connections. He's very, very wicked. I mean, mainstream media covering the guy and things. He's, he's, they're a useful idiot. He's a, he's a, I mean, Eric John Phelps. Uh, I consider him to be a great scholar on the Jesuit issue. And he said, Stephen Anderson is a Jesuit temporal coadjutor. He's there to make Bible-believing Christians look bad. And whenever Stephen Anderson gets in trouble with the media, he comes out and he says, all oh, the gays should have been shot down there at the nightclub in Florida and things. They will always say he holds to the King James Bible only. They're trying to demonize people like me and you, if you're saved and believe in the King James Bible. They're trying to de demonize us through Stephen Anderson. That's why I've been against him. But you know what? I don't stalk the man. If Stephen Anderson ever came, I'd like to sit down and talk to him. I'd like to sit down and say, hey, and, and confront him on some issues and things. I don't hate the guy. But the time could come when it'll be time to move to another city. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. <coughs> Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm talking about myself here in the ministry, but you know what? You're going to go through the same things too. You're going to have relatives that you've tried to witness to, and you go there and you have such a burden in your heart for your grandmother, your grandfather, your mom, your dad, brother, sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, whatever, and you're going to have that burden there. But you know what? They're going to get to a point where they've rejected it enough, and you're just going to have to say, you know what? Shake the dust off your feet and move on. Go preach the gospel someplace else. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 through 26. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You love that, you know. These people are actually opposing themselves. You say, no, they, they oppose you, Brother Brian. They, they, people hate you. They're opposing themselves. By coming and attacking a Bible-believing preacher, they're opposing themselves. They're judging themselves unworthy of eternal life. 
If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Gotta love that one too. They fight against repentance. These people, these wicked false teachers and things out there, these false Christians, they hate repentance. They can't stand the thought of repentance, being connected with salvation and things. They can't, under, they can't see past this thing of having to give up their self-righteousness. They hate that. They despise it. What do they need? They need God to grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Hmm. Verse 26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's the real thing here. These people that oppose biblical ministries, Bible-believing preachers and teachers like myself and others out there, you if you're saved, whatever ministry you have, witnessing to your lost relatives or friends or family, whatever, the people that oppose you are literally in the snare of the devil. They're caught by him. That's why the only means that they can use is the devil's system. They have no power to pray to God. They, I mean, a lot of them don't even believe in praying to the Lord, you know, to be saved. <laughs> it's funny, you know. <laughs> so, can't you don't pray to the Lord to get saved, so why on earth would you pray to the Lord to shut a ministry down, you know. So, <laughs> Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 6. This is where it gets to. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Um, unfortunately, I mean, there's still saved brethren. If you're watching out there and you're saved, you're a friend of the ministry, well, you're still getting something out of this, what I'm preaching. But uh, the vast majority of the people online at this point in time, um, they're just taking things. I, I, I put myself into the sermons and I, I put in personal things and tell personal details of what we're going through and whatever else. And all people do is they just, they just pick at it and then they just turn again and they rend me. They just rip me to pieces. Why? Because they have satanic hatred. Right? It's totally fine to disagree with me. I've had a lot of Christians disagree with me. All right? And we go our separate ways. Paul and Barnabas had a contention among them themselves that was so sharp, they went their separate ways. Paul didn't follow Barnabas around and look at everything he was doing and tear everything Barnabas did down. He didn't, he didn't do that. Barnabas didn't do the same thing to Paul. They said, hey, you go your way, okay? Barnabas, you want to take Mark, then you go. I'm going to take Silas. I'm going this way. All right? See you, buddy. It wasn't a, you know, when it says contention was so sharp, I'm sure it was quite a scene that was made. I'm sure they had a really big argument. But they didn't go about to try and stalk the other one's ministry or something. They went their separate ways. What people were doing against this ministry um, proves their lost condition. Just as simple as that. But it's becoming more and more aware to me that, you know, I mean, you got this wiki, what's it, rational wiki or something kind of a deal and whatever. And they go in, they take, they, I mean, you can cut my sermons up and make me say all sorts of things. And that's what they do, you know. What's going on? They're lost. They can't understand spiritual things. So I'm giving things that are holy to dogs. Dogs and swine. Dogs are male, swine are female. I mean, that's what the Lord thinks of lost people. Looks down and he sees a dog. That's a lost guy. Swine, you know, female. And of course he calls women dogs too, but... <clears throat> I'll show you that verse. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 back to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. Actually, we'll go to verse 22 first, and then we'll go back up to verse 20 and read down through. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and to the sow that was washed, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That's why I said dogs are male, sows are female. But then again, you get the Canaanite woman or whatever there. She's, you know, Lord calls her a dog. So, horrible things to say. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. 
For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. That's exactly what the case is with my enemies. Um, I didn't say people that disagree with me. Christians that disagree with me and say, well, brother, I don't agree with you on the insurance issue or I don't agree with you on the whatever, okay? Um, being in debt and mortgage or having a child at home versus at the hospital or something. That's fine. You can disagree with me. There's other issues that we can agree to disagree on and things you do your thing and I'll disagree with you and whatever. But I don't stalk them. They don't stalk me, you see. But what we're dealing with here in this verse is people that have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How do they get the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? By listening to preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen people and they hear good preaching and teaching and they escape the pollutions of the world. And they're kind of sanctifying and whatever else their life and as, as they can. They're be just doing what the preacher is telling them to do. And all of a sudden that preacher hits the nerve of the sinner. Just says that wrong thing that that sinner is just holding on to. That thing that they just can't let go of. You see... The reason they have to hold on to that self-righteousness because they got that little sin there in their life and they just got to hold on to it. And it, I'm not going to give this over to God. You know, Jesus can save me and everything, but just I'm not letting go of this. You see? They got that little thing there. And all of a sudden, I poke that little thing there. I get that little nerve and they just, and they just flip on me like that. And now I'm just hated by these people. It's not a Christian saying, well, brother, I disagree with you. You know, I'm not going to watch your ministry anymore and things. I had, I had a couple of dear brethren that, that said about the thing of, I came out years ago about Romans chapter 11, you know, saying about the thing of being cut off. Otherwise, thou shalt also be cut off. And I said, could it be possible you lose your salvation? I don't know. You know, I, I was saying, I don't know what to do with this. You know, and I'm still studying that whole thing. I do believe 100% in eternal security. You know, and I looked at it and I said, I got to be honest, I don't know. I can't explain the verse. That's all I said, <laughs> you know. And, you know, I was confused on some other things. I thought Stephen Anderson, I had so much grace, I was saying that Stephen Anderson was probably saved or whatever, or that he might have been saved at one point in time. Uh, he's done his best to prove that wrong over the years. But, you know, I was honest. And I had a couple of brethren, and they said, they wrote back and forth to me, and the one guy said, yeah, brother, he said, you're, you're going into heresy with this teaching, and he said, not going to support your ministry anymore. And that's the last time I heard from him. Graduate of PBI. Last time I heard from him. I haven't heard from him since then. And what do I think? I think he's saved. He's gone off and doing whatever. I you know, believe he's probably serving the Lord. He was you know, a very fervent uh, man of God. Um, Whatever. We had, uh, you know, sort of a sharp contention there and we parted ways, parted company. That's fine. See? But you get these wicked people that come out and they just tear me down and whatever. You're dealing with this type right here. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And that's exactly what these people do. They will get a great head knowledge. I mean, you can, you can get Ruckman books. You can, you can hear Ruckman's preaching. You can hear Jack, well, not Jack Hiles, good night. I don't know where that came from. I was thinking of uh, Lester Roloff. Why did I say Jack Hiles? <laughs> Erase that one. Okay, boy. Uh, you can hear Lester Roloff. You can hear... Um, all different kinds of great preachers over the years and things. And you can listen to it and listen to it and listen to it. And you can learn those things. You can get the knowledge. You see. You can read the Bible. You can hear commentary on the Scriptures. You can, you, you know, whatever. And you can escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You can say, I've believed. It's all just intellectual. You see. I didn't actually have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I just, with my own willpower, I believe that He died for me and that's all there is to it. I don't have to ask Him to save me. I just believe. Boom. And they can escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But 
I've seen this, these people over and over and over again in my years of ministry. And boy, they're doing great, you think. And all of a sudden, phew, right back to the world. And what happens? The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You mean to tell me somebody could actually call themselves washed? I've been washed in the blood. I've been cleansed. Everything else. I'm not saying that they were. They're making that as a profession. I'm washed. I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm whatever, whatever. And they go right back to wallowing in the mire. Why? Because all they ever had was a head knowledge. They never gave their heart to Jesus Christ. They never gave themselves up to Jesus Christ. And brethren, when you start to deal with that, when you start to see that with somebody that you're witnessing to, and you see their mind is closed, shake off the dust of your feet. Move to the next city. Say, well, I, I, I want to see him get saved. Okay. But if you stay there, and you just continue to fight and everything else, and fight to stay in that city, you're disobeying the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul didn't disobey. They're raising up the people and things and saying, get them, get them, let's stone them, let's, let's kill them. Okay. Oh, you, you don't want to hear? You don't want to hear the Scriptures anymore? There was a great multitude that got saved here. The Word of the Lord was glorified. Great things were done through this ministry. But you don't want it anymore, do you? Bye-bye. I'm moving to another city. That day will come for this ministry. And that day will come for you and your life. You don't need to be in full-time ministry like I am. Uh, you'll experience it with people. Somebody that you're really trying to witness to and really trying to, to just, oh, you think about, you know, I don't want to see them going to hell and, and you're so upset and everything. And, and they just, there's times that you got close, you know, and, and you think, uh, I, and there was that phone call and interrupted it. Or, or there was that person walked into the room and, and they stopped talking and, and I could just see the conviction leaving them and, and things. I have seen that thing so many times. I've told this story, another sermon, I don't even know when, <laughs> it was a while back. But I remember this one time, we're staying at this guy on this guy's porch when we were going door to door and this and and he was coming under conviction and it was ironic because the guy I was with uh, Jesse Dulesky at that time um, that particular day he was actually a popular kid in high school and this guy that was at the door that we were at his you know front door there um, this guy was actually a guy that Jesse picked on in school and boy, it was kind of an interesting thing when they realized who each other you know was and Jesse said yeah I'm sorry he said, you can see there's been a major change in my life. I'm no longer the jerk I used to be. Jesus Christ saved me. I was a wicked sinner. And, and boy, that guy, it just it started you know, breaking him down. He said, wow. And, and he, said, yeah, yeah. he said, I guess you really have changed, haven't you, Jesse? And Jesse said, yeah, I have. And he started, shared a little bit of his testimony with the guy, and the guy. And he said to the guy, he said, you know, do you have a Bible? And he said, no, I don't. And Jesse said, would you like one? The guy said, yeah, I really would. I'd like to know about salvation. He said, this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately. And the guy was really getting under conviction. And all of a sudden, just like that, this car pulls up literally, right? I mean, we were, it's, it was in town. You know, so we're on this guy's front porch and it goes the steps down and you have the sidewalk there. And right there's the street. So maybe eight, 10 feet behind us, this car pulls up, rap music cranked up, and they start dealing drugs right behind us. Literally. I mean, a guy comes up and he's doing the whole hands in the pockets thing, walking up and he gets down like this and he's leaning in the window looking and he's looking like this for police, you know, and, and he's handing things in and the guy's in the car, he's handing money in and the guy's in the car handing him little bags of stuff, you know. I mean, maybe it was just crafting. The guy's a scrapbooker or something, <laughs> you know. And they're, and they're doing this, and, and, I, and you see this guy, and the conviction just started leaving him, and he was, yeah, yeah. And he was looking out, kind of seeing what these guys are doing, and, well, yeah, I don't know, you know. Uh, maybe we'll talk about it sometime again and whatever else. And, okay, I, I got to get going.
Nice seeing you again, Jesse. Okay, got to go. And the door got shut, and that was it. And you'll see that. You will see that. I mean, my neighbor, I used to have, a Catholic neighbor, and there was a time he was crying. He was saying that, that when he was in Vietnam, he got really, really, really drunk the one time, and he, he said that he thinks that he, was, that he was going to go to hell, that he could feel the flames. And he woke up, and he was crying out to God, saying, God, please don't let me go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. You know, he was drunk, so, you know, I don't think it was some kind of vision. I don't believe in these visions of they went to hell or whatever else. But I was, I was so close. So close to being able to witness to that man at that point in time. And things happen. And I said, Lord, you know, I, I mean, the guy was drunk at that point in time, so I couldn't really say a whole lot. I'm not going to witness to a drunk man and get him saved or something. He needs to be sober to make the right decision. So I prayed for the guy to be sober. Next time the, I saw him when he was actually sober, I did witness to him, and he flat out rejected, cussed me out and things. Just flat out rejected the gospel. He said, I will never believe what you believe. And I said, okay, Tom. I said, you're going to hell. Well, I, that's between me and God. You, you know, you can't, you can't uh, judge me and things. And Yeah, I can. I'm a preacher. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. Okay, I have the Holy Spirit of God within me. Yes, I can judge somebody's salvation. I mean, I'm, I'm given the ministry of reconciliation. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And I'm not, but I can't judge somebody's salvation. I mean, are you kidding me? Ridiculous. And what happened? A few months later, the guy, my neighbor, Roman Catholic neighbor, drunk, fell forward into his bathtub and was vomiting, drowned his own vomit. Woke up in hell. And you know what? Um, that day that he rejected the gospel plainly, and I've been praying for a good opportunity to witness to him for, for years before that, that day, I literally shook the dust off my feet Walked away from that man. I said, Lord, he's in your hands. I can't do anything more than what I did. And uh, the day comes that Satan's henchmen, the devils that are against this ministry, the lost that are against this ministry, uh, get me shut down on YouTube or whatever else. Shake the dust off my feet. Time to go to another city. And I advise the same thing for you out there. Don't let it bother you. It'll get to you. It's getting to me sometimes. You know, it's gotten to me. Things and, and seeing injustice and whatever else. And you're going, I don't understand this. Well, whatever. Brethren, um, your job is to preach the gospel. And you let it up to the Lord to say, okay, time to leave that city. You're just going to be casting your pearls before swine at this, at this point in time. And He'll lead you to another city that actually wants to hear the truth. So, that is going to be it. Um, thank you to everybody that supports this ministry. And uh, to all my friends out there, please hold us up in prayer. Uh, we are being actively perse persecuted at this point in time. Um, there's some real wicked people out there that want to shut me down on YouTube. And I'm open to the Lord's timing because that's really what it's all about. It's not up to the most wicked, evil people out there. It's not up to them when I get shut down. Um, when the Lord says, okay, that's enough, then this ministry is going to be gone off of YouTube or you know whatever, and it's going to go someplace else. I'm going to keep preaching the Word. So, uh, I guess that's going to be it. We will see you in the next study. Thank you very much for watching.